Hey everybody, welcome to this channel, Irreverent History. Irreverent History is unscripted, uncensored accounts of the coolest things in history. TM. Not actually trademarked. Please don't come get me. I didn't actually come let me in file to get this trademarked. But anyway, we're always unconventional and always open to suggestions, so if you'd like to see a subject covered by me in my style, leave a suggestion in the comment box and I'll get to it when I can. So, this video is on the Ladies' Home Journal. The Ladies' Home Journal was actually one of the most important pieces of American media. The Ladies' Home Journal was published first in 1883 by the husband and wife team Louisa Knapp Curtis and Cyrus Curtis. Cyrus was the business behind the journal and Louisa was the editorial staff, mostly by herself, and the main editor and creative head of the journal. The Curtises were successful publishers. They already circulated local newspapers, the Tribune and the Farmer, um, several other local Philadelphia publications, but the Ladies' Home Journal was the first of their publications to reach national level. Now, the Ladies' Home Journal reached unprecedented levels of subscription. The Ladies' Home Journal in the first three years of publication, from 1883 to 1886, reached 400,000 women. That's about 21% of the American housewives at the time. All of this without internet or television or radio. The Ladies Home Journal depended on referrals, word of mouth, and publications in other advertisements and other publications. Um, they advertised in local newspapers, they advertised in Harper's Bazaar, they advertised wherever they could because they wanted to reach this underserved demographic, the middle class American woman, because before the Ladies Home Journal there wasn't a publication designed for the average woman. The only women's only publication that existed was Goody's Ladies Book. Now Goody's Ladies Book was an upper-class publication. It had fashion plates of dresses that cost $20 or more in currency at the time. They had drawings of beautifully decorated homes. They had society pages and, in and details from events that no average woman would ever go to. So the average American woman was dying for something to read and the Ladies Home Journal filled that need. And obviously, if you are an underserved demographic and you just want media, you're gonna consume any sort of media that is designed for you. And the Ladies Home Journal was designed for women and it was good. So the Ladies Home Journal was massively successful in the first years of publication, but it really took off in 1889 after Louisa restricted her time spent at the journal to spend more time at home, and Edward Bach stepped in as head editor. So Edward Bach, with Cyrus Curtis, is considered one of the fathers of modern advertising. He started processes called ad stripping, advertorials. He was well acquainted with N.W. Iyer, who was a massive pub, um, advertising house in New York at the time. He had the connections and he had the business savvy to take the Ladies Home Journal to unknown heights. And he actually was very feminist in this era, which was unusual. He uh, delegated a lot of work to female editors. He was famously quoted that in his position he need not know women when he could hire women to know women. So he delegated positions and places that he didn't know, and he gave them to women, and he employed women, and he was professionally unafraid of working on a women's magazine. He had no qualms about this magazine affecting his career, um, and he proved ev to everyone that working on this women's magazine was perhaps the best thing he could have done. So the Ladies Home Journal invented just about every modern media practice that we know of. One of the major things the journal invented was this concept of balancing the views represented. Now, Edward Bach was feminist-ish for the time period, but he was also a dude 
in the late 1800s, so he didn't really like women. Um, he was against female suffrage, he was against a lot of things, but he realized that the readers of his journal um, were for women's suffrage, because Louisa Knapp herself was a suff- not hardcore suffragette, but a little bit of a suffragette. She was more progressive than he was, so to maintain that readership and add on new readership, the more conservative readership, he balanced the views. Um, he allowed suffragettes to write editorials, and then also a couple pages away had conservative preachers write editorials, and that balance really allowed for all demographics to be represented, even in the sub-demographic of women that was previously unaccessed. Mainstream media today uses this balance all the time. Media is always trying to get to the most people possible, so they balance out different ideals within their own demographic to make sure that they get the most of that demographic. That the journal headlined was departments to organize content. This allowed for the delegation that I mentioned earlier, Edward Bach allowing women to take over in places where he didn't know, and the journal became way more organized and really easy to manage. And this seems like common sense to us now. I mean, if you have a question for the Cosmo Beauty Department, you send the question to the Cosmo Beauty Department, but this wasn't a thing when the Ladies' Home Journal was first published. It, every, everything was under one editor. So this separation of different things allowed for people to better filter their concerns and allowed for the magazine itself to run more efficiently and deal with those concerns. One of, one of the most important things that the Ladies' Home Journal invented or headlined or made popular was an invitation to respond to the content. The Ladies' Home Journal allowed women to write to the editorial staff and give comments, leave suggestions. This was huge. For a woman in the late 1800s, she had no voice. When she opened up a copy of the Ladies' Home Journal, she not only saw women like herself, but she had an opportunity to say what she wanted to say and ask questions that she wanted answers to. And the journal would respond to them with the delegation of different departments. A woman could send her concern to the relevant department. The the departmental staff would answer her concern, and if she wanted to remain anonymous, then she could remain anonymous. And that was huge, because before then, women, if they had a question about how to run the home, they would have to ask their mother or their neighbor. But if they were embarrassed about something, or if they were having a, a social problem at home, or their child was acting up, they didn't want to admit that they didn't know what to do. So the Ladies' Home Journal allowed them this anonymous channel to voice their concerns and get answers. And from there, the advice column was born. So the advice column was also really, really impactful, and it exists today. I mean, you can open up a daily newspaper and you have, like, manners sections and Ask Anne and all of those co columns that started with the Ladies Home Journal. And that those wouldn't be around except for the Ladies Home Journal. Another thing that the Ladies Home Journal invented was the concept of the advertorial. Now, everyone who's watching this is familiar with an advertorial, they just may not know it yet. Have you ever read a magazine article where half the article was delegated to one product and how absolutely amazing it was? Or has anybody scrolled through Facebook or Instagram and seen some person with a picture of like a brand of tea and talking about how amazing that is or a swimsuit and talking about how awesome and how well it fits them. That's an advertorial. It's editorial content mixed with an advertisement. And this was something Edward Bach invented. He brought famous writers, famous female writers, and he asked them to advertise products that were already being advertised in the journal in their writings. One of the big, big women he got was Marion Harlow. And Marion Harlow was one of the most famous 
authoresses of the time, and she and she endorsed everything from soap to kitchen utensils to just anything else. The concept that the Ladies Home Journal was really famous for encouraging, they didn't invent this necessarily, but they encouraged it, was competition. So the Ladies Home Journal was one of the Seven Sisters. Now in early theme, early American history, just about everything was Seven Sisters. The seven female colleges, the Seven Sisters, and the seven women's magazines. These sisters competed with each other, but in doing so, they made each other better. Some of, this, some of the sisters may be familiar to you. Um, aside from the Ladies' Home Journal, there was Good Housekeeping, Better Homes and Gardens, um, McCall's, everything like that. So each sister had a little bit of a specialty. Now McCall's specialty was it was, it started out as a packet of dress patterns. And so Edward Bach saw that and he saw the popularity in a magazine from a book of dress patterns and he decided to make a supplemental edition of patterns of the most fashionable clothes and you could get the patterns with your Lady Soul Journal. And that offered women access to the most fashionable New York and London fashions and Lady Soul Journal subscriptions rose. Good Housekeeping was famous for their specific housekeeping advice column. So the Ladies Home Journal saw that and they made the Applewood Home Testing Station and they bought products and they tested them and then they wrote about them. That sounds like what every beauty vlogger does today, right? That made the Ladies Home Journal, again, more popular. Subscription levels rose, people got more accurate and and organized information. Um, this competition made each sister better, but it made the Ladies Home Journal the best. The Ladies Home Journal became the market leader because it took every specialty that every other sister had and it made it their own. So suddenly you could get everything that you wanted to get from your subscriptions to Good Housekeeping, Better Homes and Gardens, and McCall's, and you could get it all in one place. So one of the most important things, and probably one of the most irritating things that the Ladies Home Journal invented was the, pro the concept of ad stripping. Now what ad stripping is, is when you take a bunch of ads and you push them to the front of the magazine so that when someone opens the magazine, they have no choice but to wade through pages and pages of ads to get some content. Now, anyone who's ever read a Vogue September edition knows ad stripping. Edward Bach started ad stripping and he took it one step further. At the time, this is in the late 1890s, early 1900s, magazines were printed and the pages were stuck together. Um, in the printing process, they got glued together and they got folded over and there was some shenanigans with paper. But So you had to rip apart every page that you came across. But Edward Bach decided to cut the ad section, but leave the content close together. So a woman who got her copy of the Ladies Home Journal, she had, she could freely look through all the advertisements, but she had to rip open the content. This made the ads the first thing that everyone saw and made the ads more effective. Um, the Ladies Home Journal ad revenue rose, people were advertising left, right, and center in them, and it, they made a lot of money that way. How the ladies, the biggest way the Ladies Home Journal reached the audience that they reached was they offered um, a reader rewards program or a subscription rewards program where if you referred a certain number of women to a journal subscription, you could get something in return. Like if you referred your next door neighbor one subscription, you get a doily. But if you referred your book club, like the 15 women in there, you could get points towards a length of black silk, a home organ, a piano, a set of exclusive Louisa May Alcott books. You could get, you could get points to get those things. So that pushed women out to try and get those things for free because, you know, black silk and a black silk dress, that was an essential. Every woman needed to have a black silk dress, you know, the little black dress of the day. And a good home was marked by 
the presence of a piano and children who could take piano lessons and Louisa May Alcott was one of the most impactful authors of the day. She was charitable and she was modest so if you had a set of her books then obviously you were that too, right? So women went out to try and get those things to make themselves look better and then the ladies home journal subscriptions rose. So one thing that is probably the biggest impact that the Ladies' Home Journal had was the concept of targeted demographics. Now, this might seem a little bit uh, obvious, like, duh, of course they did targeted advertising. They were a women's only magazine. Well, yeah, at the time, they were the only women's only magazine. There was goodie. And in a specifically targeted media source, you can specifically target advertising, which works. The, in the Ladies Home Journal, since it was the first major ladies journal, there were advertisements for cosmetics, which no woman in acceptable society would admit to wearing a cosmetic. But if you're in a women-only space, you can talk about it. You can talk about the powder that you put on your face, you can talk about the cold cream that you use. And that opened the door for ponds and for smaller cosmetic companies to advertise and to raise their sales and so those companies who previously could advertise only minimally now had this huge huge audience to reach and they responded in droves and advertising content of the ladies home journal was insane at one point it was one column of editorial materials to three columns of advertising in a process of writing an essay on this topic, um, my IB extended essay, I read a couple of editions of um, the Ladies Home Journal, both before and after Edward Bach became editor, and the amount of advertising is insane. And not only the amount, but just the concentration, because the ads were so small. There, there are some ads that were only that big, that big. And there was just columns of those. And it made the Ladies Home Journal bunches of money. And then that started publications like Harper's and Good Housekeeping and Goody's Lady Book and McCall and all of them start to use that. And now it's normal. It's normal to have such high concentrations of advertising. And then as other media forms were invented, television, radio, all of that, advertising moved in such high quantities and such specific targeting there. So the Ladies Home Journal started the whole concept of modern advertising as we know it. But people toss it aside because it's, it's a women's journal, it's antiquated ideas of femininity, but it's not. It opened the doors to just, just about everything that we know of a modern magazine and a modern media source. But that's why the Ladies Home Journal is so important. It started just about everything that we know. It started what we're familiar with when we pick up a magazine or we open a blog or we turn on the TV. The Ladies Home Journal was the first to do just about everything we know, love, and get annoyed by. So the Ladies Home Journal is not this symbol of antiquated femininity, the symbol of restriction. It's this symbol of how targeted demographics can actually turn into media powerhouses. How targeted advertising is perhaps the most effective form of advertising. How making something for people who don't have anything can be wildly successful and lastingly and widely impactful. Like, the Ladies Home Journal is still being published today. 1883 to 2016, even beyond that, yeah, I mean, the Ladies Home Journal is only is online only and only every quarter, but it still exists. And not to mention Better Homes and Gardens and Good Housekeeping, those are magazines that my mom subscribes to. Still, today. So, the concept of the women's magazine and the concept of all these demographics started with the Ladies Home Journal, and that's why it's so important. So I hope you like that little snippet of the Ladies Home Journal, and if you want more, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment in the comment section. Bye!